This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Siobhan Koo and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. Shivy, I hope you have an amazing Christmas. I miss you. Maybe I'll get to see you again soon. Maybe Blockbuster? I hope you're good, and thank you for having my back still. Speaking of Patreon, they recently announced an increase to their fees on small donations like the ones that all of my donors currently make. Fortunately, all of us Patreon creators have given feedback and Patreon has backed off the changes and reverted to their old model. I've already lost a few donors because of those impending fees, but I hope I'll earn them back now that you won't be charged more by Patreon. Sorry you all had to deal with that mix-up, but everything is now back to normal and every dollar you donate to this show means the world to me. This is the last episode of Plastic Weekly for 2017. I've been pretty bad at finding a balance between work life and family life over the last bunch of years, especially around Christmas time, so I'm cutting myself off and giving myself no excuses for not spending time with the people I love and the people who love me back. I hope you all get to do the same. And thank you to everyone who has listened to Plastic Weekly, especially if you started following along back in March and stuck with me through the starts and stops. I think I'm starting to get the hang of doing consistent episodes. I can't wait to bring you even better shows in 2018. This episode was recorded in the middle of the night on Monday, where a couple of us reflect and ramble on about some recent climbing news. I hope you get a laugh out of it, and you can join the conversation by leaving a comment at PlasticWeekly.com. I love hearing from you guys. Enjoy the chat. I'm here with uh, with a couple friends to kind of wrap up 2017. This is going to be the last episode of Plastic Weekly for the year because um, I want to take a Christmas like holiday, man, and I don't want to carry all this gear to my parents' house. So uh, with me right now, Sean Hunter. He's like a uh, we'll call him a friend of the show. Woo! Yeah, and uh, and actually, no, I didn't ask you for your title, but new friend of the show, Brandon Bearclaw. Hello, Brandon Bearclaw. Bearclaw. That's it. That's, that's wow. What, that's what, <laughs> and he's never coming back. To the <laughs> yeah. That's what we call him back at the old gym. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there was a, a, a bunch of stuff, especially in the last couple of months that's gone on that I wanted to talk about with you guys. Um, Brandon, could you give a quick background of like what, like what you were involved in, in the climbing industry? So people know what your history is. Yeah. Uh, so I've been climbing for like 14, 13 years, something like that. Uh, I started working at a gym in Newmarket called of rock and chalk. Uh, I did every position available there uh, <laughs> from coaching to setting to plumbing and electrical work and all that stuff. Damn, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it all. Jack of all the trades. Uh, and then, yeah, last year I switched out to uh, to Boulder's Climbing Center and I'm a coach and setter there. Cool. Could you just describe like the difference between the two gyms? Like what kind of <laughs> nuts? Sorry. <laughs> Hey now! Well, all, <laughs> this is gonna be a fun all I'm show. saying is, is there very different gyms? Like very different gyms. Well, first of all, Rock and Chalk is a 24 year old gym, so it's like really, really old. It kind of pioneered. And it's a it's a small market. Too, very right? yeah, very small. I mean, New Market's a pretty small town as well, so it doesn't yeah. cater to a whole lot of people. Um, Boulder's Climbing Center is particularly new, especially the Etobicoke location. It's like three years old, uh, with the older location being eight years or nine years now. Um, so there's a lot of newer holds, like it's a larger facility, a lot of newer, uh, like areas of the gym as well. Um, the style of setting is completely different. Yeah. Uh, no, continue. I was, I was super impressed. Like when, uh, uh, because you, you were a coach at of rock and shock and yeah. then you came to coach at boulders and that's like a, a considerable drive, right? Between the two, like it's a couple. Yeah. When I started, I still lived in Newmarket, So it was about an hour and 15 or so yeah, each way. What, what was shocking is that like a bunch of those kids from a rock and shock started making the drive. Like they stuck yeah. with you and came out to this gym for coaching. I was like, damn, we should have hired this guy. <laughs> He's got game. If like these kids and these parents are willing to drive like after school. It's awesome to see those kids still. It Toronto really traffic for like two hours or more. A like day. that's yeah, yeah, Shout out so, to those kids. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> anyway, uh, some stuff I wanted to talk about. And I, have, I have one question for Brandon oh. All right. before we get started. <clears throat> so I've heard uh, – from some longtime Rock and Shock members, okay, that Rock and Shock opened up before Joe Rockheads. Is that 
Oh, Are you, shit, is guys. that true? Do you know anything about that? I, I, I would almost say that's false. Whoa. I think it's not true. I, I don't have anything to back that up, but... <laughs> so if we do the math, back in 2012, yeah. <laughs> Team Joe Rockheads was wearing the, the jerseys 20. that said 21, right? Mm-hmm. So that was 2012. So let's all put our crap. Okay, so I know, next week, I know. Next week, I know. Rock and Shock did their 25th year anniversary. 25th. 25th year, yeah, anniversary in 2015. Okay, so they were in 1990. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 1990. Yes, yes. Okay, so do you know when Rock of Chalk opened for sure? I'm pretty sure it was 1990. Okay, like yeah. I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if a bunch of gyms opened right around that same time because it was only shortly before that they started opening in the states. So yeah, yeah. When when that news came over the telegraph wires, everybody was like, "Let's throw up some two by fours in that barn down the street." Yeah, and it was a full on uh, barn at the side of the yeah. street. Like it's 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 an old grain mill. It's like two hundred year old building. Yeah, we got to get all those like original owners together, like Guelph Grotto, Gravity. Can you just imagine the stories. Oh yeah. From- those I really hope there's owners? some like I hope there's some like bad blood between all. Oh of them. no, not in like, Toronto. There's there's all, no like, way there's bad blood. <laughs> <gym owners. laughs> but yeah, just like maybe maybe there's some like really good grudges we could like dig up. Just have a good you know like early market just like cat fight of everybody just <laughs> bitching about 25 year old issues. Yeah. That would be sick. That'd be a good episode. <laughs> not for anybody outside of Toronto, but whatever. Anyway, most recent thing uh, that came up was the Moonboard Masters on the weekend, which is cool in, in at least one way, um, like an international comp happening at the same time all around the world. I watched a bit of it. Brandon, I know you watched all of it. Yeah, Sean yeah. was presumably acting or doing his, you know, comedy skits I was or some. looking at the freedom <laughs> climbing uh, wheel, <laughs> which we will talk about later. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, for, can you give me your first impressions of of the uh, of the comp? Yeah, uh, I really liked how, like in most comp- climbing competitions, like IFSC, World Cups, that kind of thing. There's action, and then the action stops while they're waiting for the next person to get on the wall, and they're waiting for the person to brush the holds, and this that, and the other thing. With the Moonboard Masters, as soon as a team was finished their five minutes, they would immediately move on to the next five minutes. So it was like really seamless, seamless in the way that they did it. That I actually agree with you, and I didn't think of that, but it was cool because each team had a five-minute block of time, and the guy and the girl had to do their climbs in that same five minutes, right? So somebody was on the wall. The second they came off, the guy or the girl got so, on. So it was tight. Like, it was, like, happening, right? It was, like, like no you weren't, resting you weren't, time. Yeah, you so that was the format of the comp. Yeah. yeah you. Was, so your team had five minutes yep. to get both sends because the guys had a different problem from the girls. Okay. But it was – you're exactly right, and I didn't watch the whole thing, but – there wasn't any waiting aside from there was a few like stream issues where it was like, uh, yeah, something has happened. The lost a few times. It dropped in like New York yeah. every time I went to New York. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what happens when you put Daniel Woods in charge of IT, man. Yeah. It's like a disaster. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point. And that's a good thing to remember just in terms of, you know, as much as this comp has a lot of weird things about it, the fact that it's on like a standardized wall and that it's international, but that little component of having two climbers in the same five minute window on the same, wall was actually really cool um the the pressure was dope i thought the broadcast was like pretty good um leah crane was like surprisingly charismatic like i don't you know i I see her doing like cartwheels and stuff on instagram but (laughs) i've never got to hear her speak uh and she was good man like i hope she does more of that that was really cool i can't remember the name of the guy but i think he's like a a pretty well-respected trainer out there and he was like a good you know good side person not like you know, amazing, but she was, uh, yeah, she was dope. I was really psyched about that. Um, the skit at the start and the end with, uh, with Ben Moon and Jerry Ma. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what was but, that skit? Well, you got to watch it to oh. find out, man. Sorry. It was like, it was not worth watching. Don't watch. skip, <laughs> skip, <that. laughs> skip the first 30 seconds. Um, but yeah, in terms of, um, well, first of all, just for perspective, like what climbing competitions do you normally watch? Do you watch every World Cup? Do you watch as much as you can? Yeah, I watch pretty much all of it. Okay, like, cool. There was uh, one in Great Britain uh, on the weekend as well. Uh, the Big Flash, I think it was called. Yeah, I remember yeah, hearing about that. That one was pretty good. I just finished watching, well, got halfway through that last night. Was there a comp in Russia last night? There was. Weekend? There was, was an like Olympic, three, yeah. Olympic format comp in Russia. Yeah, they do it. I think it's, I think it's through their... I might be thinking of a different one. It was at least the same wall as like this military comp they did. Like all the service members yeah, that are wow. climbers, they do a big thing. So I, it was probably just the same wall. I doubt it was the same comp. Um, but yeah, so 
I watched the start and the end. I I didn't watch through the whole thing, but I'm also not somebody that will watch like every World Cup. It's like pretty rare that I do watch that stuff. Sean, I don't know how much comp climbing you normally watch. I used to watch every World Cup, and then I just started doing other things with my life. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah, and that's something I'm trying to get perspective on of like who actually watches these things and as much as you really enjoyed yourself, you're also the kind of guy that seems to like... I watch everything. Yeah, exactly. Was this comp uh, and format more exciting than a World Cup? It was for me because I climb on the moonboard a lot. I feel like it's a smaller demographic they're appealing to because you'd have to know kind of the angle of the moonboard and what the holds feel like. I guess it's cool because you could, or anyone could try those problems as well that they were doing the comp on, right? Like, yeah, provided yeah. you have the new holds, which are like pretty, oh, pretty pricey. Money yeah. grab. Yeah, it's actually a really smart business move. I <laughs> well, think, I think right? it was like, kind of coordinated with the launch of these yeah, new holds yeah. to, to do. So that is super cool. I like, I respect the business part behind that. And you are right, it's accessible. Because I think a lot of moon, like all the moon boards out there around the world have those empty bolt holes, right? Yeah. So now that there are <laughs> holds, just buy them, man. For somebody that uses a moon board and and like watches all the climbing comps anyways it was really good for you so i think they nailed it in terms of being great for climbers and industry people which i think was kind of the target especially if part of it was trying to you know sell this stuff um, but yeah for like if i was a new viewer the moon board is not super excellent in terms of like telling a story in terms of the problem right <laughs> no like, not at all. they're grabbing something like the size of a quarter and then another one and another one and and the camera angles like you know, they had a limited setup. It's a steep wall, so it's kind of hard to see. But it was it was definitely tough to understand what they were actually climbing, unless you know a moonboard really well. So yeah, I think yeah. for someone like me who's like seen a lot of comps and said a lot of comps, uh, and just trying to relate to someone who knows nothing about climbing, that must be a really hard <laughs> comp to watch on a moonboard where it might not be exciting at all for for someone who has, knows nothing about climbing. Yeah, no, that's that's totally true. And so I'm 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 curious if they had an intent beyond making a comp for people like us cuz I think they did a good job of that, but I I I'm I feel like they probably didn't intend for it to be anything beyond that, right? I can't imagine it going further. No. Um but I had a um who was the uh, the head setter for the comp? <laughs> <laughs> this guy clearly hasn't watched it. Uh, the climbers set their own problems. Oh. And then the people around the world had to try and climb it as this well. This was on a, a board from the moon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, but it got me thinking uh, kind of around the same time. From a commentating perspective on certain things, I was looking at a comp problem that was all flat hold slopers, right? So black flat hold slopers. Everybody knows what those are in their head. Or if it's like the new so ill slopers where it's just like that, like vomit green, yeah. eight of them in a row. <laughs> and I was trying to think if I was trying to describe how a climber was getting through one of those climbs, how would I describe their path through that when the entire time everything is the same thing? And you're like, they pop a heel hook on the green sloper, mm-hmm. reach out right to the green sloper, and then if they can manage this mantle on the green sloper and reach up left with the left to that <laughs> green sloper, they might just win this thing. The last guy managed to get to the green sloper, but <laughs> unless the next guy gets to the green sloper, they're not gonna, you know, make it to finals. And uh, I totally understand that monochromatic setting is like sick for commercial gyms, and I think that's the way to go. But in comps. It's kind of tough when when that's kind of eking into like commer- I shouldn't say the word commercial comps, but it's eking into like North American competitions, right? At I, World Cups, it's good. Like they use a like a slew of weird holes. Yeah, World Cups, colors. it's like whatever country yeah. and gym you're in. Exactly. It's like, who knows what the hell you'll yeah. have? So it's a different mix of stuff. You know, it's it's fairly easy to tell a story because there's a, a red triangular volume. There's a this. Um, but for like North American comps and some of the stuff that's going to come up that I might hopefully get to commentate i've been thinking about that i'm like oh this could be like pretty difficult um so from from like a storytelling perspective i'm kind of a little bit worried about that i'm wondering if that's the best way forward for like spectator competitions to just make everything monochromatic and use for instance um trying to think of a set i think visually it looks nicer like even for a comp uh, maybe if like like as the if the holds were the same color, and then maybe the features were a different color. Yeah, um, I don't disagree that it like looks good. But I get I totally see how it'd be hard to 
you know. If but you're- the other thing is the looking good thing, like we talk about it from a commercial side as like wanting to get people onto the wall to like attract them to that climb. Mm-hmm. And that's not a thing when it's a comp set. I feel like it is a thing when it's a comp set because you want the problems to look, to pop and to look good to the audience. Like a lot of those comp problems probably aren't the best climb. Like they're not, I bet you those athletes wouldn't want to get back on those climbs and in a gym <laughs> session, right? Like those problems in comps, they have a job, they have a purpose. Yeah. And uh, I think as a setter, uh, trying to figure out how to separate athletes, you, always, you also want to put on a good show and trying to make sure the problems are visually pleasing to the audience. Do you think, so there was a comp and I honestly can't remember where it was, but it was really cool because there were distinct sections to the climb. Like it was a world cup lead comp. So it was a big old wall, lots of volumes. But I remember the commentator, it was probably Adrian Battersby or whoever was like doing it back then. But he like, there was a roof section where the volumes made a clear like S shape. And so he referred to that as like the snake. And just these little things were because the volumes were a different color in that area. And they made this shape. He suddenly had like a different, he had a way to start telling the story of this climb. And it was little things like that where if you, you know, I can't expect root setters to be worried about, you know, the commentator (laughs) trying to build a cool narrative for like every climb. But if, if there was more, a little bit more thought put to that, or even just letting go of the idea of keeping everything the same color and maybe, you know, having a starting section with one particular color or, or not using the exact same friggin' flat hold volumes for one problem, (laughs) like that would be super helpful. And, and, uh, I don't know. I I think beyond hold color though, you could tell stories with movement. Like a lot easier. Like it just if you're having like a really like coordinated yeah. movement or co- like tell a story doing I that. Think, instead, yeah, you, know? you are right. Um, but the second the climber comes off the wall and they're not on there and you're not telling the story that's happening, how do you then go yeah. back and like interpret what happened? Where you say, you know, kind of the example I already gave. So anyway, that's just something I was thinking about, and you kind of got me thinking about that with the moonboard thing. So, <laughs> anyways, um, but yeah, moonboard masters, pretty cool. Next thing, uh, you kind of brought it up, so let's just talk about it now. Uh, a thing came up in my Facebook feed called the Freedom Climber, and just checking back now, it has like 139,000 views, so like decently viral. Um, I'm obviously like a climber, so climbing stuff comes in my feed and things. But this thing's really stupid, um, <laughs> and I kind of showed you guys what it was. For anybody that's wondering, it's basically like a – it's um. It's kind of like a, a hamster wheel. <laughs> it's like a bad splatter wall. Uh, it's like a vert wall. It fits inside your house. So it's like, I think eight feet, eight or nine feet tall, eight or nine feet wide. It's got a circular section that rotates like across the Z axis. Anyway, it's like, it's like a game show wheel that you climb on. So like a tread wall, as you climb it, your weight rotates the thing. And so you kind of get like this endless set of movement except it's not a tread wall it's uh i don't know i'm i'm gonna have to put a link in the description so find it for freedom climber but i just want to get your impressions of of who this wall is good for if anybody i think this wall people are getting this wall for christmas (laughs) and that's gonna suck for them man i think this wall looks amazing um it's, it's the future it, it it's it looks like it's a very simple wall to put together or to construct like in your gym or house next year freedom climber masters it's, <laughs> it's a nice shape it looks like it's uh, very easy for beginners to get on they'd understand it right away and the wall looked like it was splattered with jugs so i think it'd be pretty easy on the skin and i think this like uh a moon board or a uh, whatever other kind of board that has like lights on it or <laughs> or a tread wall. The angle is just so harsh for beginners where this wall is completely flat and you're always kind of traversing sideways. It's like it's way better than just kind of going up. And I, th- I think that's why beginners would like it a lot more. And in the videos, Are you getting paid by these guys. What's going <laughs> on here? This is so much bullshit. It hurts. No, you like you look at the thing and they're basically climbing in a perpetual layback. Just like how the thing It's rotates. like right yeah, foot pe- to the right, left foot, like high. There's climbs step. outside that are just laybacks. Don't and people, give me this. People Don't. love Let's, it. Like Earlier today, he's like, Sean's talking to me. He's like, what's the most controversial episode you've ever put out of Plastic <laughs> Weekly? Like he's going to break it. And now he comes on and he just like gets gun shy. And he's like trying to make this thing sound good. Anyway, let's be, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a climbing wall for CrossFit people. 
and they're going to enjoy it for six hours. It's at a gym called, did we mention the gym name? The gym (laughs) name is Spooky Nooks, is the gym that features this this wall. I don't even know if that's a climbing gym. I feel like it could be. No, it looks like a fitness crossfit-y. Climbers could not possibly like this thing. It is not for climbers. Straight up. Like, it's not possible. As a climber, I don't understand how you could enjoy this thing. I, f- I feel like there's so many more advantages to this wall that I can't even name them. <laughs> you can um, just go home, man. Yeah. You, can, you don't have to stick around. <laughs> yeah, Sean's reaching back to the promotional video. Um, and one of, I th- one of the comments made was that a minute on this thing was night and day compared to a minute on a regular root wall. Because you wouldn't like be resting and stuff just like think that. About By the way, much... you can rest on it as much as you want. You just stop moving and it stops. <laughs> and it's all jugs and it's vertical. Think about how much training you're doing for your obliques <laughs> by going sideways like that. Like it's it's a lot of core in there. <sighs> There's also like the infomercial for that like elliptical that has like a pull down as well. It's like an elliptical machine, with and it's like it mimics real rock climbing, and they show like a rock climber on a climbing, and it, the actions are not the same at all. No, it's so. I think I guess what I'm getting at is if you're hearing this episode, you should make sure that anybody you sees that video in your family, or if they share it, or like ask for it for Christmas or anything like that, don't don't let them think it's cool. Like it's, they should get it though, Sean. It's like you're <laughs> killing me. If your family likes like spherical walls, yeah, <laughs> like you'll love this wall. It's like no. this. I I'm trying to think of what a what a comparable product is where it's like it's it's made for people that don't know what they're talking about. Like the tread wall works. The tread wall the does a thing. It does a thing. Right? It does a thing much better than that thing. Yeah, you can put a ton of wall like a ton of holds on it. And it doesn't limit your movement too much. Like at the angle, but I is feel a like with limited. a tread wall, you can't go Sean, sideways. Don't. <laughs> like, a tread wall is just straight up, dude. You just prop a box under the tread wall, tilt it a little bit. You're going sideways. I feel like that'd Done. be very dangerous. Set okay. up like three tread walls side by side by side. <laughs> I should make it clear that I do not advocate putting a box under a tread wall and tilting it 45 degrees. You should read the user manual. Yeah, you should get a, a freedom climber <laughs> wall. <laughs> obviously okay well you've been no help sean thanks a lot man uh yeah freedom climber uh go to freedomclimber.com and watch the videos because it's uh, it is really funny um i'll, I'll i kind of want to know what the technology behind the wall is just out of curiosity because it seems like it could be a cool thing and maybe somewhere out there there's like an applicable use for it but this product should not be given to climbers i think they just put like a big nail through the middle of the wall <laughs> into the back so it can turn <laughs> It's like a just volume on a lazy Susan. Pour some <laughs> olive oil down the back so it rotates smoothly. And just you get olive oil with this thing? Oh, man. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. Avoid the Freedom Climber. Uh, CEC has... Uh, CEC is the Canadian Climbing Federation. They have a high-performance director now. They were looking for one, and they got one. You guys are both competitive climbers. Um, Brandon, have you ever done any international comps? I can't recall if you've, I have not. You've not, but you you compete at nationals basically every year. So yeah, you're you're up there, Sean. You've done a couple of international comps. From your experience, uh, high performance director, is that something we need? And if it is, what should they be doing? It's definitely something uh, the sport needs. Um, and I think the individual who was selected, I think he worked a lot in gymnastics, and I think he had the same role. I believe I can't remember what exactly was said. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of changes that are going to happen to, you know, how we select the team, the, the Canadian youth team, the open team, how they select coaches and managers and everything. And this, I think this is definitely like the way to move forward, uh, to get climbing competitive climbing where it needs to be in the future in Canada. So yeah, his name is Jeff Thompson. Uh, he was previously the national program director for gymnastics, Canada, and the, uh, under his time, the men's national gymnastics team achieved its best ever results. So pretty, pretty cool endorsement of his stuff. Um, based on where we're at, like in terms of the talent in in Canada, and you can use yourself as an example, or we can talk about just like Sean McCall and Atlanta Yip as our, as our top athletes. 
where does somebody like this come in? Like, what are they? So I'm assuming a lot of what they do is going to be, like you mentioned, organizing the national team, all that kind of stuff, maybe working with our medical officer to kind of create guidelines um, across how we how we uh, govern things at a national level. But from our perspective, all of us have been youth coaches. Is that going to make a, do you think it's going to make a really big change um, on like on the jobs we have? I think at the club level, it won't yeah. change anything really. Um, Could we use something from him? Like, is it something we need? Like you guys kind of know who the coaches are these days. Is it something where we could really use some more national guidance right now? I don't know if a high performance uh, director will create any kind of uh, coaching specific certifications or anything like that. I think that would take like a committee from the CEC to do that. Um, So I know, as I said before, I don't think this would change a club coach um, uh, coaching his athletes in a gym. I think this will just change how, uh, you know, athletes are selected and coaches are selected and whatnot for the national team. When you say that, what direction do you think it's going to go? Because like I've talked about this before and maybe we, t- I can't remember if we talked about it in our last episode. We were like so drunk last time we talked. <laughs> it was like yeah, the two, of us two in the afternoon and the heaviest <laughs> day drinkers you can imagine um, while we're all sitting here with Perry. We were just dizzy from that freedom climber wall that we were on. <laughs> too many laps. We did Man, way too many one laps. minute on that thing, <laughs> yeah. I was wasted. It's like day um, and night compared to all the other. Um, you know, I've, I've, maybe not on this podcast, but personally I've, I've wanted the teams to be a bit smaller. Um, cause I've like, I've traveled with both the open team and the youth team. And there's definitely a cutoff where you see some athletes that certainly aren't getting a lot of athletic experience out of it. Um, I, I, if youth team, especially, it feels a lot like just a summer camp in some regards, having just watched it from the outside. Um, you know, all these kids are obviously talented, they're good climbers, but on an international stage, there's not much they can do, especially if we want resources for our national teams. I feel like I don't want those resources going to kids of that level just yeah. yet. I want yeah. them to develop more before we start spending money on flying them around the world or anything like that. Is that something that, uh, that we would expect like just the trend of other national climbing teams most places send a pretty small set of uh of climbers to these comps or at least the teams you kind of respect send a fairly small (laughs) (laughs) tyler's the most liked climber in canada by the way yeah um i think um i know obviously i see uh both ends of this spectrum um, yeah, you're an athlete who, like, what's the best placing you've ever had in an international comp? An international comp? Uh, Have you ever made semis at an international no. competition? Do you think it's, like, obviously you're paying your way, right? Yeah. So you're not really a burden to anybody. You know, you you pay your own way to I get to I think you things. have to be at a certain level uh, to compete internationally and represent your country. Um, I personally feel like when I did go, I went to four World Cups, I was not ready um, I I wish I wish there was a a um uh, I think they took like maybe the top fifteen or twenty could apply to go. I think it should be the top six at nationals. They make the team and only those top six are allowed to go. And I feel like uh, with the youth, it should be like the top three in each category yeah. if they're allowed to go to international comps. If that category is allowed to go then uh, they should be able to go. I feel like that's if you're top three in the country, I feel like even if your field, your category is a little bit weaker, I feel like if you place top three, you should be able to go to represent your country in a World Cup or Youth World Championships. Um, But I think um, also like, yeah, a lot of kids could just pay for it. They could afford to go. Um, And right now there's no funding in no funding for climbing in Canada. So if you only had like the one kid go, uh, who was the all-star kid and no one was even close to, uh, being at her level or his level, um, that you probably wouldn't be able to afford to send a coach just with that one athlete pay for the flight and his hotel for all the week, like the whole time he's there at the comp. So I feel like the way everything is structured now, um, you kind of need that many athletes to go to kind of get coaches to go and for fees to be cheaper uh, for other athletes. 
I think that's fair, except I don't know if it's important for fees to be cheaper for a lot of these climbers, right? Like, I I feel like I don't care that much how cheap it is for a lot of these people. <laughs> like, I'd rather it just be more expensive. You should be taxed for, like, you know, showing up and just bottoming out every comp. I, it's, yeah, it's, there are... Uh, so I've been looking into how England or how uh, Team Great Britain kind of mm -hmm. uh, does this stuff. Yeah. And they very early choose kids kind of not from their national competition system. They basically find the kids where they're like, you're going to join our developmental team. It doesn't come down to national results. They pick the kids where they see the talent and they see the dedication and the support. And they're like, you're the people we're going to choose from. It doesn't matter if some crusher comes up in some area and wins the entire series. If there's something about them that, doesn't vibe with what we're doing we're not taking them um and i i you know so you mentioned that you like the idea of top three that's a worthy accomplishment and they should go mm -hmm. for yourself brandon as a coach i know it's hard to make these calls with kids because they work hard and they're all you know well-intentioned kids they're all good people yeah. do you think it's it's worth like kind of just making a cut being like you know okay i know you happen to come first place at this competition but we know you better than that we're not taking you. Like, could you handle doing that? Could I handle doing that? Probably not. Maybe not that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like what's the point? But, like, if, if it, you're youth and there's so many different categories for youth, it's not open. If you come in first in your country, like, you know, and, and if you're just going by, like, there's no more regionals or anything for these kids. Like, their points from provincials or the locals, they don't mean anything. Yeah. They, yeah. You're just looking at their result from uh nationals and i had to some kids who bombed nationals last season or uh, were injured i had to really um i wouldn't say fight is the right word i had to you have to um, advocate for them if yeah. they don't put up the results yeah especially if um i'm from these i'm from ontario uh no, none of the other coaches were from ontario so they didn't really know some of these athletes and i they're kind of comparing the athlete who uh, might have been injured or might have had a really bad showing to like an athlete who was nowhere near their league but did well at that comp somehow. I, th I think the biggest thing is is for a lot of us, and we've all been in, in our particular scene for a while, I think any coach that's been in a scene for five years or more could probably say at the start of a season, you know, which kids just based on their like lifetime track record – have the kind of attitude that you want from somebody to reward with going to an international event, have the consistency of how they place and all that. Like we've all seen comps where there's a winner who is not the consensus best climber sure. of the yeah. group. Right. And I think that's where I'm basically saying, you know, because of root setting, because of good days and bad days, because of injuries and things like that, I comps are fun and exciting and we should definitely keep doing them. And over time they matter, but I don't, care if you won nationals like few like f you know there are definitely national events where in a bouldering comp somebody will win with you know one top in the least amount of attempts and you say okay well that's not really you know that's <laughs> but who's gonna yeah. select that one athlete if the people who are on the selection committee are from out west well, I think and, that's like, something where you hopefully hope that the selection committee isn't like some terrible group of people. And I don't think it is. Like, I, I definitely understand that if you're from one part of the country, you know people really well and you probably have a more favorable view of them. But I think possibly with a high performance, uh, you know, director who's less removed and has probably never coached these kids <laughs> hands on. Right. Um, and even just just taking the long view and, and looking at their history at past events, I think it should be fairly fairly easy to see what's going on like if we look at the and not just youth but like adult nationals as well if we look at that roster and you look at the top 20 you can cut half of that list at least right away and be like no half doesn't <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. you can cut yeah you can cut you could cut it down to probably like top dip, well dip, you know obviously we have a couple standouts. some of the strongest climbers in the country uh i'm speaking about the men they yeah. a lot of them have never made a semis at a world cup totally yeah it's what like, uh sean mccall jason hollowatch seb Lazur, maybe elan jonas mccray well he has for lead like, for lead yeah yeah i don't think but basically there's a gap like yeah, between sure. first place and second place there's oh, a yeah. mile of of experience and strength and so that's where i say you know yeah, Lana Yip, very confident that she should go to the World Cup. And then the next step down, Alyssa Weber, Allison Vest, maybe Pia Graham, maybe Leah Wachowski, maybe Bronwyn Karnas. 
but there's a huge distance you know between yeah. Atlanta Yip and those climbers and so those climbers got to show up cuz I've never seen particularly good world cup results out of them so that's you know yeah they're, also, all, they're I, all in the top 6 but like, like but how long has Lana yet been doing well for internationally like oh, I don't know this is an honest question no like, that's that's totally true like this was her breakout year she did a lot of international and, stuff in the year before as and, well but how many years has she been competing internationally well, she would have been on the Canadian youth team at the very least. So there's yeah. a chance if she wasn't doing well back then that, like, going by what you're saying, you yeah, wouldn't have fair. picked her to go. Totally. That's that's why I think the Great Britain yeah. model of having the development team would, I think, be a positive for, for Canada. And it, granted, that's like a ton of money and a ton of coaching. A and ton we're of resources a huge country and, and, and massive. Saskatchewan yeah, and Manitoba's like so in the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> having that team of people that are, like, not quite ready for World Cups, but they still can be trained up to that level so they can climb on, you know, World Cup level yeah. boulders and climb yeah. with other people who I, are psyched around the country. I so. think my, my problem is I don't think Alana Yip got this good because she was allowed to go to a bunch of World Cups That's and only lot of make it to the first and that, second like, clip. Snowballed year after year, right? Yeah, but th- like she, so a year of competitive climbing for an athlete is every local and every provincial and every training <clears throat> session with your coach, and then a combined total of you know in her day there would only have been youth lead, uh, yeah, like youth yeah. lead, right? So a combined total of maybe two minutes of international climbing, mm-hmm. right? And so you look at her entire competitive year when she was 14 and 15 yeah. and 16 and 17, all that stuff. One minute of international experience mm-hmm. compared to that entire time. I'm not sure it's enough for us to say, yeah, we should be sending all these kids. I'm not saying all the kids, not? but I think if she didn't compete at that age in a, at international comps, she wouldn't be where she's at now. I don't want to argue with you because I don't <laughs> want to make it sound like you know, it made absolutely no difference. It mm-hmm. probably did, but I'm not sure if it's enough. And I'm not sure, like in Canada, we have the problem where it sucks that we don't have Pan American Continental Championships more often. And it yeah. sucks that we don't climb with the Americans. Like the strongest in some categories, United States generally takes the top three spots in youth yeah, international saw that comps, at Pan Am's. Right? Why like, can't our youth A girls up here in Canada, sent, like if we could get them just with the Americans, like that's that's an international comp right there. You're going to get the full smackdown just by traveling down the road and you know happening to climb with uh with Brooke Rabatou and Ashima and the whole, you know, that 2000 2001 cohort I think of it's, destroyers. Uh, some people just want to be a big fish in a small pond and they don't want to go down south the the ocean. It's <laughs> yeah. starting to happen though. I mean last weekend a bunch of Canadian youth went down to I, the Yeah, States. I really like that. Yeah. I think that's uh, super important. That said American regionals or this was regionals, regionals. right? Regionals, yeah. yeah. American yeah. regionals is the equivalent of an Ontario local. Like yes. Yeah. U.S. locals are a joke. Yeah. Burn that down. It's not a thing. <laughs> That's just a Most waste. controversial <laughs> episode. The U.S. Inferior no, comps to, it's, to it, Canada. Anyway, we're not going to... We could we could totally get into that some other time. But uh, yeah, so anyway, high performance director. Good. Get rid of all of our climbers. <laughs> okay, I want to bring up uh, a letter that was sent out from, if I get this right the owner of Touchstone Climbing. And it was an open letter addressed to, uh, sorry, it's Mark Melvin, the CEO of Touchstone Climbing, which is a line of gyms out in California. He sent out this open letter to gym management and owners, uh, basically talking about the quality of flooring under roped walls in gyms in North America. And uh, the little part I want to read out, this is from the the cover letter, is uh, is the following. I've been climbing almost 40 years. I love Yosemite cracks, desert towers, and the occasional waterfall. Almost every sport climbing area I end up near, and I climb in someone else's gym every chance I can. It takes absolutely zero imagination to know that a 30-foot fall to two inches of foam will not go well. Please don't do it at your gym. Touchstone has pushed against standard development for our industry. We think that outdoor practices work and that our best that our sport is best if not dumbed down. It's unusual for us to be on this side of this one, but it's so darn obvious that a modest investment relative to the cost of a gym can make a difference. Let's not let a person die this way even if by their own fault. So, what's interesting about this is that <laughs> A like a, a gym owner, somebody with with uh, with a stake in it, is is verbally trying to raise standards or call people out on low standards. So, 
for those listening, if anybody's not super uh, familiar with this, there's something called carpet bonded foam, which is what you usually walk on if you're at a climbing gym. It's a, it's a, a little layer of, of carpet. It's usually gray, blue, purple, or red, because I think those are the only four colors it comes in. Uh, and it's got some some really like dense, hard uh, foam underneath it. And then a lot of gyms put some softer open cell foam underneath that two, four, six inches, something like that. More frequently, a lot of gyms have only been using the, the closed cell foam in their roped areas, which has a little bit of give, but if you jump on it, it still feels like a hard floor, right? Uh, we've all been in gyms that have all these different types of flooring. So we all know what it feels like. Some gyms you walk around, it's really soft. You feel like you're kind of walking on the moon. It's all squishy In other gyms. It's a pretty hard surface. So this this letter he put out, he basically contacted Flashed Climbing, who do a lot of flooring stuff. They did a bunch of drop tests, um, and it was at Touchstone's behest, so it wasn't something Flash put together. They just helped him out with it. And the numbers aren't good. Like, if you fall 30, I think the test was from 45 feet, I believe. Can anybody see it on there? Yeah, 45 feet onto a, a bunch of different technologies, but it's basically a disaster if you're landing from the top. <laughs> like, not that that needs to be said, but if you're landing on, on two inches of, uh, of carbon bonded foam, like that's, it's probably not gonna end well. Every fall is different, and I think we've all seen or heard of people walking away from that kind of fall. It's obviously rare, but it happens. But there are also people that have had their lives changed or, or uh, ended um, with a fall like that. So. What I want to kind of talk about is, first of all, the letter doesn't, it's not there to offer solutions. Um, it offers some test results of different types of flooring. So it gives you a good idea of, of what, uh, you know, gives good protection in one of those critical falls. But it makes me really interested to see what companies like Flashed Climbing are ready to offer or ready to develop for this because, you know, these, these companies manufacture flooring. They, they put together foam and sew together all of these like cool packages for bouldering. Um, I'd like to see some innovation on, on the, the roped end of stuff. Um, and we were all kind of talking together and the big difference between boulder flooring and rope flooring is that with boulder walls, after every climb, you're going to fall onto the mats, right? Like that's part of the sport of bouldering. So after every climb, whether you top it or not, you slam into the mats. That's why they're there. And those mats get worn down because of how much people land on them. That's their purpose. But the mats under rope walls, I think a probably, probably pretty generous, but they will probably deal with a 45 foot fall hopefully pray to God less than once every five years. I don't want to jinx anybody, but that should be super rare. It should be extremely, extremely rare that a fall is broken by the matting underneath lead floors, right? So aside from somebody not getting first clip on a lead and they have to come down, aside from those little things or somebody traversing and hopping off, these mats are like a last resort for a really rare instance. And so when we talk about this stuff, you know, in this report, it mentions of, of the options tested, the, the safest uh, option was uh, carpet bonded foam with six inches of, of uh, open cell foam underneath it. Yeah, it's good for that, but it's terrible to walk on. Um, you're going to be throwing it out after a couple of years, not because it's been worn down in falls, but because it's been worn down by people walking on it. It's hard to walk on. Wheelchairs can't go across it. It's hard to drag your your holds uh, hold wagons across it. Like it's not a practical floor. So um, I'm just curious from your perspective, the different jobs you've done, if this makes you think about, you know, what gyms should be doing or what your dream flooring is for uh, for roped areas. I think Jim should just go back to gravel flooring. It, like, <laughs> I was going to say, absorbs I absorbs so much more. Yeah. Uh, it's just better uh, than foam to absorb. Like gravels, I think it'll come back in the future. And Do you really think that? I'm curious. Well, hell no. Gravel is like, I, I've heard it does absorb better than foam, but gravel is like filthy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've never taken a fall on gravel. I don't know if you guys have. I yeah. only know one gym that has gravel. I was at a gym in Nashville, actually. I was. Yeah. I think VR in Ottawa has gravel. In they one. don't anymore. Oh, they don't? Oh. Yeah. They, they came into the I wonder future. what they did with all the Or maybe gravel. not. Maybe they left the future, according to Sean Hunter. Maybe they should have stuck with it. I, I think that, yeah, like I don't think gravel's attractive. I think it's... And you, you wanted to stick clip first. Like, oh, every yeah? Time. Yeah, you didn't want to like go up to first bolt. And, <laughs> and the first bolt's probably like eight feet, ten uh, yeah, feet. Like yeah. nowhere, right? Yeah. Like, I think, yeah, there, there should be like an industry standard of what totally. you should have under a climbing wall. 
Like, yeah, it's because it's kind of common knowledge now. If you build a bouldering wall, it's effectively one inch of foam for every foot of climbing, right? Like that's and a drag thing. mats. Yeah, that's. <laughs> 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 yeah, make sure your mats aren't continuous. Make sure they have to be moved, and make sure they're light enough so that a kid can pull them out from underneath you as you get towards the top of your. I, I feel like this letter is just kind of like I don't want to say anything bad. Because about any gyms that might be working at it at any gym in the future, but the, instead of writing this kind of like yeah, this letter is good. He wrote this letter, but you should be doing something to try and create a standard for this if you feel so strongly about it. I um, I like that he sent the letter as a as a gym CEO. It's obviously not his job to start product development for mats, right? Like yeah. he probably has other stuff to do. And again, Flash was just, I think, hired by Touchstone to conduct these tests. So Flash didn't, you know, put this thing together. But now that this, you know, this has been circulated, there's now documentation that kind of says, hey, us as the climbing industry understand that this isn't super great. So that kind of starts to slowly set the, the like, duty of care at gyms higher he, and he higher. He did all this work. It's like, <laughs> uh, yeah, basically threw all the, the global warming's the a thing and yeah. do something about yeah, people. Yeah, and it's on paper now, man. Like with with numbers, that's like math on this thing. It's I, a I serious feel like there's deal. some danger in making your mats capable of taking a fall from 30 feet. In what way? I, I feel like if you're saying, hey, we just you know, increase the size of our mats. We, we have this, people are going to do, people just start hucking they're off. They're not going to just huck off the top of the wall, but they're going to do some, some crazier things. You know, I think like case in point was when the Grigri came out and people mm -hmm. like were first attracted to it because they felt like it was automatic that it would lock up. So they yeah, stopped like having their hand baby. on the brake rope. They stopped, you know, just like paying attention to the climber when they were belaying. Fire up the like grill that. and start cooking dinner at the bottom <laughs> of the cliff while your friends up on belay. Yeah. <laughs> And I've been uh, thrown off the Freedom Climber a bunch of times and having that extra <laughs> bit of foam under me. Put it away, weird. man. Nobody's buying the Freedom Climber. Stop. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I kind of think about that. Um, I I don't worry about it so much, but I do worry about just like the, 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 the usability of the space when you have such cushy foam mats underneath you. Like a gym I worked at used to have flooring like that. And it is hard to walk around on and stand like, on. It's surprising how much effort you use to move through How much it. do you think it costs um, to just do carpet bonded in the gym for the rope climbing? I cannot give a number, but just like, let's say the two inch carpet bond yeah, foam. Yeah. I'm gonna, and it's, been a while since i dealt with these prices but i'm gonna say just that mm -hmm. versus that with two or four inches of foam underneath it is a quarter of the cost mm -hmm. than having all the extra foam underneath it and that foam in your high uh your high use areas your yeah. walkways is going to be crushed after like two years it's yeah and that's my problem with it is that that flooring just is only used for people to walk on you can't right? put a price on safety. like there is well, and that's that's super fair, but what I think I can say is there's got to be a better option than just these two products that were not made for climbing, just sandwiching them on top of each other, throwing them under the walls and being like, yep, that's the absolute best we can do. You know, we're a you know, multi-million, if not billion dollar industry, and we refuse to think any harder about this. So, you know, I, I've been really attracted to the ideas of having floors that are basically fairly rigid, but when you take the kind of forces from a critical fall, it crumples, right? So we've seen things where there's plywood under under carpet bonded foam, which would hypothetically uh, crumble or crack and take kind of a lot of that force uh, through the wood. I know it's something that you see in, um, oh, what was the example I was gonna give? I'm lost. Somebody bail me out of this, uh, this, uh, this dead end. Like, um, yeah, like why, like I know a couple of gyms who do have that wooden flooring yeah. underneath, but you're still like, it's still the two inches of carbon bonded foam and the wood. And then there's concrete under no, you. No, they've, they've all been like, uh, so under the With wood the square blocks. Yeah. Foam it's like as four well, to six wood, inches yeah, yeah. of kind of an array. Right. Like so it still crumples. That's a lot cheaper than doing like six inches of, you know, closed cell. And then the yeah. two inches of carpet bonded, like it's way cheaper, but I also don't know if any gyms have actually had that tested and like proven what it is. Cause like now thanks no, to this letter, we got numbers here with like G forces, which I don't understand. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anybody's done that for these. No, cause of, there's, uh, there's no, floors. I think climbing is still in like the, we're all in the, like the wild, wild west. There's no standard for anything for, 
for yeah. a lot of things related to obviously for like climbing equipment, things you climb on, things you use, but for padding in a gym for under a root wall, like and every gym seems to do something different. Like Yeah, I I think where I'm at is I think it's I really like that Mark Melvin, the CEO of Touchstone, sent this letter. Um you know, he only sent it to gyms as far as I know. It's not like he went to an industry watchdog and was like, hey, man, like you should come investigate this stuff. Uh, but I really hope in the coming months you start to see people like Futurist and Flashed uh, and all those guys that are really popular, Asana, all those flooring companies. I want them to start talking about this because the market's huge. Like take every gym you've done boulder flooring in and add even more floor space to use some new technology. Like, I think that would be sick, but I'm not a fan of like just cushy foam. I think it's stupid. It sucks to like operate on. Like I've only worked in really good gyms, so <laughs> they've all had really safe flooring. So, that's so I don't know about you two. I'm, a, <laughs> this might be crazy, but I'm of the mindset that I, I feel like roped walls should be protected to first clip past first clip. It's the rope that is protecting you. I, 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 I completely agree with that. I think it's, uh, and kind of what he does mention in this letter is like, he understands that like outdoor climbing, the ropes, all you have, there's no reason to not take that culture in where we say belay properly and you're not going to hit the floor, man. Like that's reasonable. But I think it, it kind of makes it sound like there's been something that's either happened in their gyms or nearby <laughs> yeah. Yeah. where they've seen a thing happen where they're like, man, a little bit. And not to say that that did happen because I have no friggin' idea, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was instigated by an accident. And I've seen a couple of accidents and you think, you know, like, what could we have done to, to make this better? And it, it sucks that they could be preventable, but most of the accidents that I've seen or that have been reported have been mm -hmm. like off a bouldering wall or off a, like a back okay. bouldering Auto wall. Yeah. <laughs> Auto belay accident. And, or, but, but here's the other thing is that all of these that I have heard of have been user error. So yeah. I don't want to make it sound like, you know, the gyms are cutting corners. It's people not clipping into auto belays yeah. and people trying to learn how to, you know, friggin <laughs> people trying to learn how to Load build an anchor properly. at the top. Of I think even if wall. those same people were taking 30 feet falls onto things that could like, you know, better protect their fall, they're still going to hurt themselves pretty severely. Yeah, no, you're it absolutely doesn't matter right. what you're falling off of. I feel like feet. if you're on a freedom climber, there's no way to hurt yourself. <laughs> so that's another point for the freedom climber <laughs> man this thing is getting popular and the freedom climber is way cheaper than getting foam in your gym it's a night and day difference i would say all right oh i'm getting caught by my uh, by my thing last topic i want to bring up because sean hunter you're pretty old uh <laughs> so <laughs> just to knock you down a peg uh so Sh sean we did an episode months ago now where we just kind of talked about you and everything sean hunter right yeah uh -huh. uh, one thing we talked about was the fact that you you still consider yourself a competitive climber you train yep. constantly you're in excellent shape and you want to do a good job at these competitions yeah uh, so we got a comment on, uh, on one of the episodes and if anybody wants to leave comments on this one just go to plasticweekly.com uh tiffany melius uh if you don't know her she's uh she's an australian national living in canada uh, she, you've probably seen her boulder in the last couple of years at world cups wearing the Australian Jersey. So a super strong climber. She left a comment on the age thing. If I am successful in achieving my goal, I will be competing as a 36 year old athlete at the Olympics. The old mentality is a difficult one to overcome. And I think it deserves more discussion. Is it an actual hindrance to performance or is it a symptom of our youth obsessed culture? I don't think uh, the hindrance comes from my age. I think it's with all the responsibilities that come with my age, uh, like having to make all my own meals, having to work like 40 hours a week, having to drive to practice, uh, having to train by myself because I'm not on a team. There's no adult team at the facilities I train at. Um, I think it's easier for a youth climber to train because they have people who support them and help them. And for uh, an older climber to train like a youth climber, like you need to be a sponsored athlete. Well, here's where we can start to talk about like, you know, where, uh, where athletes really start to excel at different ages. Cause if you look in some sports, you will see, you know, 40 year old baseball players and football players, which, you know, football is definitely a dangerous sport that wears down your body. Um, but you will not see that in gymnastics for an obvious cliche example. Um, where do you guys think climber, uh, climbing falls in that spectrum? I think Hint, it's not football. I think, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Like I think there's always going to be like an outlier to every sport. Yeah. Someone yeah. who could a climber who could be 36 and still do well and stuff like that. But then like it depends like what country you're coming out of. Uh, like you could be strong climber for one country, but if you're from England, you could like never even make their team. So I think that's another thing that comes into it. Well, let's put it just on like a on a on you know like a, an even scale of just you know person to person, regardless of where you're from or anything like that. What about you as a climber? And just because Tiffany brings it up, is there something about you as a climber that gets better with age? Uh, I think your experience, yeah, gets, experience. obviously gets better with age. And also, uh, just uh, for most people, I would hope uh, the older they get uh, with the experience they uh, uh, get, um, just able to control your emotions when you're climbing if things are going bad like you'd have that experience to like calm yourself down and i think i've gotten to a point like i'm not the str- obviously i'm not the strongest climber um out there but i feel like with climbing i've i've seen everything and done every type of movement in an indoor artificial climbing wall i don't believe there's any type of movement that I that I will do in the future that I have not done before. I think climbing moves are like notes on a guitar. There's only so many of them. And yeah, they may be arranged in a different pattern, but uh, th- there's nothing, nothing new is going to happen. No one's going to create a new move. So I think with age, uh, recognizing those patterns of movements and putting them together and figuring out what you have to do uh, really makes you excel, whereas a novice like youth climber has issues with that. I feel like uh, you're at an advantage as well with your, your training and how, how you train. Um, like I for, personally have never had a coach, uh, but my training at age 18 was like way, way, way different than my training right now. It's more focused. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm doing more of the correct things at the right time. I'm not just throwing myself at a wall on days where I don't feel physically like well to throw myself at a wall. Um, so I feel like the, the older you get, the more familiarized you are with like your training routines and like, your training schedules. Granted, you could have a coach doing that for you at uh, a younger age, but there's only so much that a coach can do, I think, for an, an athlete. Does it make up, though, for the fact like the graph for experience goes up as you get older, right? So as you approach 30 and approach 40, you are getting smarter. You definitely under yeah Yeah. well yeah god some climbers Mm. uh you get smarter you get more experience you understand your body better for sure but your physical ability just your body's natural ability for strength and energy is going down right and so my question is like at some point you're you know they don't make up for each other so does does that increased experience at, at how old are you brandon i'm 26 26 and 30 for you sean yeah do you feel like for yourselves personally that you're in a better spot than you were now that you're more capable and you have more potential as a competition climber now than you did when you were say 18 19 20 like i started climbing when i was 19 so i kind of missed it as a youth well mm-hmm. i don't even think i would have been able to afford it uh growing up um but i feel like now what hinders me with climbing is just the time with so many other things i have to do in life like the time especially getting to the gym and training and i know that's a bad excuse but you got to make money as well to support yourself yeah i mean i started climbing at the the same age okay. like taking it seriously at the same age i started you know just going on the walls at like 10 11 but yeah i feel like it's only been improving every single year like my climbing has only been improving i haven't really found myself like uh it's been a slow improvement i will say that like very very slow but uh every single year it's been gotten a little bit easier a little bit better and a little bit more focused so it was hard like last year i was working 50 ish plus hours a week and then trying to train on top of that it was just like exhausting uh today i was in the gym at 9 30 a.m and i didn't leave till 10 30 it's well been, then okay it's like so long days and no one time. made us dinner <laughs> no we have to go home and make it ourselves i'm surviving off perrier right now <laughs> so and yogurt we okay so we i think i think we could like fairly say that in the current conditions you bring up these you know extra responsibilities as an adult there's a lot to worry about we can fairly say that the current trend of top level climbers getting younger and younger and younger will probably stay the same I think we can agree with that. Like you're going to see more Yanya Garnbretts. You're going to see those World Cups be occupied by younger kids. Do you think if we 
got so much funding or got enough funding that you guys as athletes, assuming you're at that level, if you guys had your lives paid for and you didn't have to worry about anything other than climbing, do you think you would still stand it? Or do you think people your age in general would be showing up more at World Cups or be able to compare with those, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds that we're seeing from places like Japan. It really depends because you can look at like lead World Cups and you'll see. Depends. <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. It's Come a on. Half give, answer. Me, give me, give me a full. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> uh, like lead World Cups, uh, you'll see people like Roman de, Roman de Grange, uh, who is, I believe, 34 or 36 okay. years old. So older by those standards Maybe uh, it's just because kids don't like rope climbing <laughs> it's like nobody builds rope gyms anymore all the kids but the are movements are like way less <laughs> like uh, I, at least the movements i've seen in previous world cups are way less coordinated way less jumpy throwy all that stuff like way, way less like risky that's fair too do you think older climbers uh would be able to have longer careers if they just focused on lead climbing and which of the three disciplines is best is most suitable to the youngest climbers I think bouldering is definitely suited for younger climbers just being more so than power more so than speed oh the, I if you have to all if three you have, yes. yeah, all, i said all three because Come speed on, you need uh, like experience like years and years of work on that route in particular like years of focus on it yeah but. i don't know i feel like and because the one thing is there's certainly an age where i feel like you want the extra bulk but that said you see climbers like you know margo hayes and other really tiny ass climbers who they can be super explosive without that much bulk. Like but that I, speed I, route is big, like very, very big. It's a big old speed route. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I just think more youth are pat more passionate about bouldering. So they're going to do better at bouldering. And I think that's suited. I find bouldering and speed climbing are, I find speed climbing a little bit more similar to bouldering just because of the power uh, and explosiveness. Whereas the rope climbing, you don't have a lot of that. So, yeah, I'm going to say bouldering for youth <laughs> is uh, is suited better for that. Like, I'm not – obviously, there's outliers. There's going to be someone who's older who could do well in any discipline. Like, I think there was, like, a 40-year-old gymnast in the last Olympics. Like, is he the last yeah. one the one before? And yeah, there was. from Italy sure, or somewhere? Yeah. And... Are you sure you're not talking about equestrian? <laughs> Come on. That's where it's all, like, the dads. It's just, like, it depends. Curling. But I think – if you look at the majority of climbers, they're younger, right? Who compete, yeah. so and who do well on the World Cup circuit, like experience can only take you so far. Yeah, <laughs> but no, definitely like there's I f- like you just look at the the kids who I've coached. It's like I guess me and Brandon, like Brandon said, when he was eighteen, nineteen, he was doing whatever in the gym. He didn't have a coach or anything like that, and then. I, I coached a girl last year. She started climbing. Uh, she's been climbing for like a year, maybe a year and a half. She joined a team. She was doing maybe like V2s, V3s at the beginning of the year. In one year, she was like doing V9s, and she was like one of the strongest, like physical, physically the strongest climber on the team for the girls. And like for youth just take in so much more uh they could be coached a little bit easier yeah. they don't have any baggage they're not stubborn they'll show up for practice do you think that it, it, what kinds of baggage because like being a teenager sucks no i just feel like adults have uh they're like super like kids can be stubborn but i feel like adults will just be like well i've done that i don't need to do that i don't need you to tell me to do that <laughs> whereas kids it's just easier to mold mold them and explain to them what they have to do and why they should be doing that whereas adults they're just super like anyone who's like coaching an adult team like how flaky is an adult <laughs> team at any gym you go to i'd never want to coach any adult climbers uh, who weren't like pro like because they got issues they got problems they got a freaking go home to their wife or girlfriend or feed the cat or make dinner or get home from work they're gonna be stuck in traffic uh, like, side note i coach an adult group and they're all great uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well and i like i gotta say i'm seeing you know the the gym i used to work at they're starting to put together you know older teams because those kids from back in the day they become adults and some of them happen to stick around and i'm psyched for you know, adult teams in the future because they're going to be dope as hell, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully that's just the Canadian national team. That would be cool if we have some like actual training groups for them together. I think if these but, like youth climbers, competitive climbers stay with it, then the adult teams would get better. I think when I'm talking about adult teams, like the gyms I've 
been to, a lot of the adult teams, like, they're not paying for coaching or anything like that. Yeah, they're recreational teams. Yeah. Kind of like the Canadian national team. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Basically. But anyway... Uh, Sean, thanks so much. It's like after midnight at this point. We, you said you were talking about Chris Sharma and some cologne thing. Do I have oh to bring no! This up? So I'm not. Brandon, what is what did to, that mean? Yeah, <laughs> uh, Sharma did a uh, an advertisement spot for. Oh God, I I don't know. Polo, you said Tyler. I was gonna say Gucci, but I don't <laughs> think they make cologne, so I don't I don't know anymore. Tyler, I gotta bring this up. Man. We're not ending the cast okay so it's definitely at climbing.com <laughs> and now i just gotta find this thing i'm gonna edit out so much of this silence <laughs> okay article by john bergman at climbing.com published november 9th so this is like an old thing um but uh basically yeah chris sharma did an ad for polo's latest scent and they claim that it will ignite the thrill seeker in every man. Is this scent called Dirtbag? <laughs> <laughs> For climbers everywhere? No, so it's, you know what, I it's not a uh, it's not a specific Chris Sharma scent. It's just, it's a new, it doesn't smell like Chris Sharma. It smells like weed! <laughs> Damn! <laughs> but basically, climbers are being used to, to market stuff that I'm guessing people like tennis players would have marketed in the past you what? know classy athletes <laughs> which climber is going out and buying this cologne and putting it on in the gym or at yeah. the crag like i uh you know i think a lot of the the article talks about just the commercialization of climbing but i think that is probably a better point is that whoever does the marketing for polo completely got it wrong and there's not a person on earth that like there's no, I feel like there's just no, well, okay, I shouldn't say that because think about your gyms and how many of them are like young professionals that need like an extreme outlet after their day of like working downtown yeah, in the you, financial district. Like it's just good to see climbers getting money. I'm sometimes. glad he's getting paid. Yeah. He's balling. He's got yeah. that like polo yeah. money now. This is, like, well, that's and the thing. Same is, with Ashima and Coke. Yeah. Whereas, well. it's Everyone freaked out, but it's like, hey, Ashima's making it money from it. It is dope that these athletes are getting non-endemic sponsorship i think that's awesome i would really like it if we start to see that like at the ifsc so that we can start organizing like sweet comps and stuff like that um and uh, maybe we should just make comps more exciting or something so that people yeah like if you put them, them on like a moon board that would be super no you put them on the freedom excited. wall the freedom <laughs> wall <laughs> that's what they're trying to build down in the states brandon <laughs> what was it called it's freedom climber oh yeah freedom climber Jeez. sorry freedom wall <laughs> Those Mexicans won't know how to get over that freedom climber wall. <laughs> okay, now this is just... traversing all over the place. <laughs> well, I love Mexicans, by the way. This episode has been brought to you by the Freedom Climber. Check it out at freedomclimber.com. <laughs> um, the awkward pauses were brought to you by my bad decision to provide Perrier to everybody today. So we have to like stop to like burp out the side of the can, the <laughs> Not side me. of the microphone. Um, thanks so much, guys. For like, it's a Monday night past midnight. Probably. I'm unemployed, so I am too. What's your excuse, Brandon? <laughs> I'm up at seven, bro. <laughs> uh, and we basically just had him here to talk about Cologne and the Freedom Climber. Brandon Barraclaw, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me, Sean Hunter. As always, thanks a lot, dude. Anytime, <laughs> any place. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to end on that inflection so bad. All right. That's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Sean Hunter and Brandon Barraclough for sitting down to chat, and thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you liked this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app, or consider donating a dollar or two each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly. I love mailing out stickers to new donors each month, so I hope I'll see your name on my list. Make sure you visit PlasticWeekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes, including links to everything we talked about in this last hour. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at PlasticWeekly.com, and you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to Tyler at PlasticWeekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there. Somewhere. Good luck to everyone competing over the next few weeks, and a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. I'll be thinking about you. Talk to you in 2018.